Today on the Pat Mayo Experience, full U.S. Open course and stats preview. Keith Stewart joins me from Read the Line to really talk through the different angles of this course, how we can apply that to betting and the players that we should be looking at, and of course, the stat model rankings, both for Pinehurst and the course conditions in general. Use the time codes to jump around. All of that, plus cash giveaways, fantasy national giveaways, and how to get in on a split of a $50,000 giveaway. Well, at least up to a $50,000 giveaway. Let's get to it. I'm Pat Mayo. This is the U.S. Open Picks Preview Research on Mayo Media Network. Here's what I'm going to do for you right now. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the course. Smash the like while you're here, and we'll get to the giveaways in a second. But when we take a look at my rankings on FantasyNational.com right now, you will see the player that rates out the best. Well, the two players. One is in the model rank, one is in the mixed condition model rank. And when you want a more in-depth breakdown of both of those, just use the time codes. They're coming on later in the show. But if you want the quick cheat sheet, the four best players in this field right now that rate out, Xander, Scotty, Rory, the three best on the betting board, shouldn't be of a surprise to anyone. Hideki is next, and the next two best, Fleetwood, Morikawa, and Russell Henley. That is the shorthand for what you're looking for at the U.S. Open this week. Other players who rate out fantastically in both versions of the model, Brooks Kepka, Keegan Bradley, Ludwig Oberg, and let's see, Tyrrell Hatton, Siwoo Kim, Harris English, Cam Smith, Justin Thomas. These are all different names that you could potentially utilize this week as we go through. I want to give you the quick cheat sheet before I told you about how to get into the draws for up to $50,000, a $500 cash giveaway, fantasy national memberships, two ways to do that during this show. You hit the description. Sometimes I even put secret giveaways in the description. You can always find info down there, but code Mayo at underdog fantasy right now gets you a deposit match of up to 250 bucks, helps out this show and gets you in that giveaway. If you have not done underdog fantasy as of yet go do it right now using code mayo and get yourself into all these draws thank you very much for that additionally if you're listening to the audio version of this show well that means you're probably already subscribed so go leave a rating and review five stars you get ballots for doing it on apple and on spotify you do both you get double the amount of ballots if you're watching the video version of the show you can go do that right now all right Let's talk about Pinehurst number two before we get to Keith Stewart, the quick info that you need this week. We're going down to North Carolina for Pinehurst number two, the first time that this course has been played at the U.S. Open since 2014. That year, Martin Keimer ends up winning by eight strokes over Ricky Fowler and Eric Compton, Dustin Johnson, Keegan Bradley, Brooks Kepka, and Jason Day all finish inside the top five for that week. More on that leaderboard a little bit later on if you do want to hit the time codes. It's playing as a par 70 this year, 7,543 yards. We think about that distance, and it is playing as a par 70, but that puts it on par with Augusta National, Quail Hollow, and Mirfield Village in terms of overall length. All those courses are separated by 25 yards from top to bottom, but this one will end up playing longer because it is only a par 70. So relative to par, a lot like Valspar in that way, and even a Riv that compared to power they just play very very much longer than you would think ultra dwarf bermuda grass more on that in a second is the green type there are 117 bunkers across this course there's one hole with water in play and the average green size is 6500 square feet the average fairway widths in the landing areas are actually between 35 and and 45 yards, making the driving accuracy percentage, at least in 2014 at Pinehurst number two during this U.S. Open, around 70%. So that might be the angle to play this week again on Underdog. All of the breakdown of what we did from Memorial trying to do that, and it did work out. We just picked the wrong guys. I think the same thing might be in play Thursday before Underdog can react to that at the U.S. Open. Code Mayo at Underdog if you want to get in on that. In 2014, Pinehurst number two became the first facility to host the U.S. 
Open and the U.S. Women's Open in the same year and in consecutive weeks. That will not be happening this time around. And this will mark the first U.S. Open played on champion Alter Dwarf Bermuda Grass Greens. Pinehurst number two switched from bent grass immediately after the 2014 event. So we're going to look at putting stats in a little bit, but they might not be quite as reflective of what we've seen. As Keith will tell us in a little bit, that the roll on these greens are very pure with this Ultra Dwarf from Munigrass, very much like at Sawgrass, very much like in Phoenix. So maybe we could even take a look at that. I did some Sawgrass intuition work a little bit later on and around the green stuff at different comp courses. But if you want to use fantasynational.com slash Mayo to get yourself 20% off to go research that on your own, be my guest. I think that might actually be an angle we can use. And don't don't forget that this is the most difficult cut in golf to make. 156 players, top 60 in ties end up making the cut. There are going to be flameouts across the board. I would predict the winning score this week to be minus three. And that's being optimistic because, you know, you might have one guy like Martin Keimer who ends up running away with it, but just looking at how this course is both designed and the potential win that could be coming in this week, that that is something that you might want to pay attention to, that there's going to be a lot of bogeys, but you still going to need to make your birdies and pick it up on the par fives this week if you're going to have any chance of contending. Keith Stewart is coming up in a second, but as I mentioned a little bit earlier, Tambo is giving away 5% of his winnings in the finals at the Fantasy Golf World Championships if he makes it there. He needs to get through Memorial before he does any of that, and you can get a share of 5% of his overall winnings. Now, top prize is a million dollars. That $50,000 could be given away here, and you can get a piece of that by using code Mayo at Underdog Fantasy, rating, reviewing, and subscribing to the Pat Mayo Experience audio podcast on Apple and on Spotify. Now, if you join the free newsletter, you get ballots into my giveaway draws for the US Open. I got 500 bucks in cash pittance compared to potentially 50,000 that's being given away. But I will guarantee that one of you will win $500 cash. I also have two Fantasy National memberships to give away this week. So smashing, rating, reviewing, all that fun stuff gets you into both draws. I'll be announcing the winner, I think, either on next Monday show, not this Monday show, next Monday show with Feinberg or on Cut Sweats Live this week. But you guys waited long enough. I give you the quick preview of the course to dig in deeper and the players that meet the skill sets. Keith Stewart from Read the Line is coming up right now. As mentioned, because this is the U.S. Open, we need to go big for a guest, someone who knows about these things, about the course setup and how the different elements are going to play such a huge and vital role this week at Pinehurst number two. Keith Stewart joining me on the line. Sir, it's an honor to have you on. Thanks for joining Uh, us. I mean, it's an honor to be with you, Pat. You know, you inspire me every week with everything you do. I, I, I you know, golf betting's tough, and you make it entertaining and accurate, and I, I love it. So, um, it's man, I'm I'm humbled and excited to be here. Let's get into it because the, it's a U.S. Open, and God only knows what will happen. Well, we were just briefly chatting before we started recording that. Out of all the USGA setups for courses, it seems like this is the one they can like mess around with the least like we're not going to get a repeat of saturday at shinnecock hills and pinehurst no i i definitely don't think we will i think that what donald ross has done with this property and then what bill carr and ben crenshaw have done to restore it back in 2011 um is a very simple template and if they just let it play out then i i think the winning score will be right around maybe like three or four under par and we'll have a great championship so hopefully they won't mess with it Unless Martin Keimer ends up uh, rechanneling what he did a decade ago and just annihilate the field every time that somehow like I remember vividly watching it and like Tiger would be in or sorry, like even Ricky, when Ricky was trying to like somewhat yeah. move up the leaderboard, he'd end up pulling it a little bit into whatever the hell they're calling the not fairway area. And he's behind like a plant in the sand. Every time that Keimer missed a fairway, he just had the best lie out of there. It was just the luck factor for him. All week. I mean, he played excellent golf. I'm not going to take that away from Party Marty Keimer, but he got all the breaks, all four rounds. Yeah, and you know, it's one of those things, too, where, and I know we'll get into this, but you have to game plan the heck out of this place. You know, Ross is notorious for what's called switchbacks, which means that off the tee, you're going to hit it one way, and then when you approach the green, you've got to bend the ball the other way. And when you do that, and the landing areas are tilted or there's swales or anything, you're going to get bounces that are going to take you out into that wire grass. So it's going to be very interesting to see how some of these guys, I mean, 
you know, it's it's what maybe Scotty is the new Martin Keimer, you know, 10 years later that he wins by eight or something. But um, he, he's one of the best game plan guys out there. I mean, he's so cerebral, which is why he's so good at Augusta National. And uh, I'll be very interested when I'm down there to watch Scotty, how he prepares and how he attacks this golf course, because um, you have to be pretty smart about it. And he's definitely the smartest golfer out there. And he has the one major thing that most of the high-end players do not have. I guess Xander does have it as well. But for a guy that hits the ball so far, his accuracy is just off the charts. You just don't see that with guys who hit the ball so far. He's ridiculous. And they're going to be hitting the ball far. I mean, definitely one of the things we're, we're going to be keying on are approach shots over 200 yards. I mean, we have, what, four par fours over 500 yards. <laughs> So even if the place is running mildly fast, they're still hitting 200-yard approaches in, um, which is might be a seven or a six iron for Scotty, but still at the same time, into those turtleback greens, they are going to have to be very precise. Maybe that falls more into his hands, but Scotty's also pretty good with a wedge too. And, you know, Payne Stewart proved that that was something that you needed to be able to do to get around that place as well. So looking back at the 2014 leaderboard, Keimer wins by eight over Fowler. Uh, Fowler and Eric Compton, they, they ran the same Eric Compton vignette 84 times yeah. during that week. But yeah, good for him coming in second at the U.S. Open. But those were the only three players that ended up under par. But just take a look at some of the guys, just in your mind, the skill set of players. Like Keimer, in my mind at least, I mean, he, he gained a bunch of distance versus the field that week, but primarily in my mind, he's more of an accuracy player off the tee very yeah. similar to how we won at sawgrass in a weird way that both sawgrass and pinehurst are two courses where you know you can do whatever you want from around the greens it seems but if you're terrible around the greens you can get out the texas wedge and putt some of this stuff as long as your lie is not so bad well it goes back to my game plan comment uh keimer said at the beginning of the week he was going to putt off the short grass all week in 2014 that's what he did that was his strategy he stuck to it and he did very, very well. I, I'm with you. I think he got a lot of lucky breaks that week when it when the ball did head off of the short grass or the green grass, we'll put it that way, and he went into the wire grass or the sand or those barren areas. But overall, whatever your game plan is coming in, you, you definitely have to be. And if you look at the, that top 10 and around that time, right, you look at a guy like Jason Day or you go back to, you know, DJ in his prime, you know, those guys were incredible ball strikers with their long irons. They could launch the ball really, really high, which is definitely a characteristic of Scotty. You know, he is not somebody that flights the ball low at all. When I'm out there walking with, I mean, that, that guy hits moon balls with every club in his bag. And that's going to be a huge advantage here because with that sand-based soil, even though it has been raining a fair amount there, and it will over the next two weeks. Um, you know, I, I think for sure that somebody that hit the ball with a higher apex is definitely going to have an advantage. And you look at guys like back then, you had Brooks, you had Stenson, you had DJ, you had J-Day. I mean, all of those guys, Ricky, they all fit that bill. Yeah, and even to look back at some of the other names just outside of the top 10, this is where I thought it got kind of interesting. You know, Marcel Seam, who... He yeah. did gain in distance for the week and lost in accuracy, but he's sort of like the primo short off the tee, very accurate European player that you would think of. Kevin Na uh, was came T12, Justin Rose, Matt Kuchar, Poulter, Jim Furyk. Like you have that collection of player who's sitting there who aren't, I mean, they're very good with their long irons, but they actually have to hit legitimate long irons from beyond 200 yards. Unlike someone like Scotty or Brooks or DJ or Day, like you were mentioning, but it does seem like outside of Stenson, Everyone else, I guess Stenson and Keegan, who ended up coming in fourth, everyone else just has a tremendous short game. Oh, there's no doubt. And you, you got to remember, too, you know, Donald Ross, this was one of the first properties that he worked on when he came over right around 1900. So all of his influence is coming from Royal Dornock or just, you know, being over there in Scotland. Uh, they're exhibited here, you know, and as as he spent more time over here in the United States, you know, 20 years later, some of the golf courses really started to resemble more of the target golf that we see over here, but early on in his career, I mean, these are also going to be guys like one of the things that I took a, a long look at was the 150th open championship at St. Andrews. So if you really have to pay attention to that leaderboard as well. And a guy like Cam Smith, who everyone, he's going to be super chalky and, and we all know that, but look at some of the other guys that were on that leaderboard that got the job done. They were up near the top. They all have great short games. They were all great lag putters that week. You know, they all have the ability to be creative in and around those greens. Cause there's a lot of bumps and humps that they're going to have to try to figure out and they can't 
practice every angle on every hole during the practice rounds. So at some point, they're going to have to just be good with a wedge in their hand from 50 yards and in. And those guys are going to have a huge advantage at this place because even though it looks like it's long at par 70, 7,500 yards and change or whatever it is, it still won't play that long. It never seems to, right, Pat? Like it's always, it's a 500 yard par four. And then it's like, you know, Bryson's hitting driver nine iron, you know? So it's like at the end of the day, it's it's really going to come down to how you can chip and put that ball around around those green complexes for sure. Now, normally when I'm doing U.S. Open research, especially now that the PGA of America has shifted outside of Valhalla this year, I suppose, the setups that they have for the PGA Championship where they've just been a lot tougher over the past six, seven, eight years or so, that combining those two together and seeing the similar sites, types of players that do well at both those major championships tend to be pretty predictive. Uh, it's weird that the U S open can be held at different courses every single time. Yet the guys that play well at the U S open continue to do well at the U S open. But do you think that we can use that for this course in particular? Cause this one, it's a lot, I mean, it's funny that you mentioned St. Andrews. Cause I feel this way about St. Andrews in the open Rota as well, that people who don't play well at any other, open championship venue can weirdly just always do well at St. Andrews. It doesn't seem to share the same sorts of similarities as all the other courses do. And that's how I feel at Pinehurst, but I might be wrong about that. Would you agree or disagree? Oh man, that's a great point. You know, you start to think about would like which one of those PGA championships would really, I mean, obviously Southern Hills comes to mind, just pops into my head right away. You know, like JT and his short game um, on those closely mown areas uh, there's just so much influence with Bill and Ben, with Gil and the work that they all do in, you know, restoring all of these old golf courses. Um, I, I wouldn't see a lot of similarities with what you would see at like an Oak Hill or what we saw this year at Valhalla at all, like out there, it was certainly because it was so soft at Valhalla when we were out there, but that's a really good, that's a, that's like a really thoughtful way of thinking about it because um, it seems like, even though the venue like drastically changes in these U.S. Opens, right? It is it, well. Go if going back, it's power, power, and then it's power again. And then if it's a place like Shinnecock, then a couple guys pop up like they might here at Pinehurst. But I still think the themes. I, I think you're spot on when you're doing your research. I think the themes are going to be the themes that like after we go with length and long approaches, then around the green is just going to have a huge amount of weight here more so than it would at a place like Oak Hill where it's all long grass or something like that. So um, yeah, I think, unfortunately, I think you're going to see a lot of the same U S open guys. Do you think that the short game might be a little bit different because you have so many different options from off the green? So I kind of noticed that your general U.S. Open style course, and it kind of popped up when I was doing my memorial research this week, because once you get off the green, at Memorial, you're in thick rough. Yeah. Like there's there's no runoff area. I mean, there's a few, but generally speaking, it's a lot like Bay Hill in that way. Like once you're off the green, oh, you're sure. in the shit. And someone yeah. like Victor Hovland, for example, has a tremendous amount of problems chipping off of tight lies. He's actually like not so bad at a really thick rough. He can just kind of hack it. And for whatever reason, he's pretty good at that. You're just yeah. not going to have that luxury here that it is going to be a lot of tightly mown areas uh, or where you can put it. Like even heritage would be one. Like I remember when Stuart Sink ended up beating Morikawa there. Like, I don't think he yeah. pulled out a wedge the entire week from off the green. He just used his putter the entire time. Sink actually had a top 15 here back in 2005 when Michael Campbell ended up winning as well. But just to take a look at it, like Keimer, hmm, what, what's Keimer won? I mean, he obviously won at Whistling Straits. He won the PG. He won the Players' Championship. Ricky, who came second, is a Players' Champion. Stenson, oh, yeah. who came in fourth, is a Players' Champion. Day, who came in fourth, is a Players' Champion. Adam Scott came in ninth, a Players' Champion. Should we be looking at Sawgrass? Oh, 100%. And here's why, Pat. <laughs> there was a guy that served at Fort Bragg back in the 40s. His name just happens to be Pete Dye. <laughs> and his, and his, his um, golly, what's, what would be the right word? His supervising officer would go over to Pinehurst all the time and play golf, and Pete would go with him. Ro Donald Ross is a huge influence on Pete Dye and the use of the ground game versus aerial architecture when it comes to designing golf courses. Now, Dye is so good at like giving you these things that kind of like distract you. So you see these little pop bunkers or you see these like these objects always like jettisoning in your way or these bulkheads and these like really like sharp edges. And you don't see that at Pinehurst, but it, it 
it's exactly the same. I mean, Scotty, Cam Smith, those types of guys are going to be a huge factor this week. Matt Kuchar, you know, like it, it, because that is one of the most strategic places just like St. Andrews and and just like what we're going to see at Pinehurst number two. I mean, this is a template golf course. You know, it does. It, there's nothing fancy about it. There's one hole that has a pond and it doesn't even come into play. I mean, it's just sand, grass, and, you, you know, basically what? Some bushes on the ground and some and some pine trees. I mean, this place is, is, is really, really going to rock some people's worlds because they won't remember it from 10 years ago. And when they see it, it's going to look so rustic, right? But when you break it down and you kind of look in between and read between the lines, then you are mo that you are no. There's no doubt you're going to see a lot of Pete Dye influences here. Certainly from places like Heritage or Hilton or Harbor Town, and especially from TPC Sawgrass. So one name kind of pops up. Obviously, Scotty pops up. He just won both of those events, yeah. and I, I don't think anyone's going to pretend like Scotty isn't the overwhelming favorite with the perfect game for this course. But I'm thinking like Siwoo. Maybe a perfect guy for here. And it's funny because at most U.S. Opens, kind of crap. Like does not possess anything that you would really want for U.S. Open. Deadly accurate, amazing short game. Can't really putt, but these sorts of courses are exactly what he does well. And even this year, yeah, I mean, obviously he's won the Players' Championship, but he had another top six finish this year that when I'm thinking about guys down the board a little bit, he was the first name that really popped up for me. I uh, ooh. don't like it. If it yeah, prolific, if it was prolific winner, see, woo, Kim. Yeah. Um, so here's the thing when they start putting, that's where I worry about a guy. I mean, don't, I mean, the guy can thread it through a needle, um, off the tee. He, he is un, an unbelievable ball striker. But like, I, like I was saying before we came on, these greens, they're turtle back greens. So everyone thinks that they have these huge undulations in them. They're actually quite flat. They have to be because the edges, like a third of the green, you know, so whatever. Whatever the number is for the square footage of the green, you have to reduce it by almost a third, and then the target is in the center of it, right? And you have to really be able to hit it, um, but they can't make the greens that wild after that. You know, they're not like Augusta National. So, like, if you're a good putter here, you'll be able to play well. You'll be able to make putts, unlike you can at Augusta National, where everyone is on, on the defensive the whole time. So, like, I love Siwoo at a place like that where, like, great putting is mitigated. I think this place, much like a St. Andrews or something like that, if you're a really good putter, um, I mean, this might be the one way that Scotty can be approachable or that Scotty gets a couple bad breaks in the wire grass and it causes him to have a couple of bogeys or something, or maybe a loose double bogey. But like overall, I, I think that really good putters will do much better here. So I uh, further down the board, I wouldn't go, I wouldn't go as much with Siwoo as much as I would take my chances, like in that price range with like a Patrick Reed, who's going to hit it all over the place. But like when he gets from 50 yards and in, he's just going to score much better than Siwoo will over the course of four days. Okay. You're not going to talk me off of Siwoo, but I understand the point here because, you know, I cross yeah. my fingers and hope it's that one of the two weeks a year where he can <laughs> somehow do it like Lucas Glover did at Colonial and then kind of forgot how to do anything t to green because that's just kind of what he does sometimes but you know it was nice to see him actually putt well for once maybe i mean he's also a type of player for pinehurst that you would think would be really good like he he's not he's gonna hit basically every fairway great with long irons fantastic yeah. short game can't putt to save a lick but it happens no. sometimes yeah and you know what i mean he won a u.s open back in 2009 on a golf course that uh I mean, probably what some would say in modern times is the hardest venue for major championships. That's best page black. Um, so it, you know, like Lucas could definitely be somebody and, you know, with, you know, with his sec background there in golf, um, you know, Oh wait, he's Clemson. So that's what ACC. So anyway, Southeast background in golf. Um, he'll be very familiar with that playing in the North South. Um, he, he would definitely be somebody that ball striking wise, I, I think, I think I would just be careful. If you look back at 2014 and all those names that you listed, there's a lot of guys in there that hit it a little bit loose. These fairways are going to be wider than they normally would at a U.S. Open. But when it comes to scoring, you're going to have to be able to get the ball in the hole. And those will be the guys that I'm going to be leaning on more so um, than I am going to be just like pure ball strikers because um, even, even the best of them could miss a fairway or two with the with the different canting and the way the, the fairways move. Um, so like, I still need somebody that can score. And, and I really think that that's, that's a key around this place for sure. Well, 
Uh, t- tell me a little bit about these greens because they're Bermuda grass, but like, how does that compare to what we see in Florida? Like, are they similar? Are they, are they different? Are they going to run a whole lot faster? Because I think Bermuda and this type of like for non elite players, like someone like Russell Henley would make a lot of sense yep. to me. Again, great iron player, fantastic. Oh, great wedge player. Great wedge player, fantastic yeah. Bermuda player, has had success at a lot of the courses that we just kind of pointed to. And then you yeah. could also get into like Brian Harmon, who, I mean, I just despise to no end, but if it's going to come down to the players where he just came second, he won an open championship, dude makes every single putt. He's like fancy Denny McCarthy. Yeah, I, and why don't you like Brian Harmon? Because <laughs> I lose so much money on him. Oh, He's, he's brutal for sure. Uh, when it comes to that, I, I just don't like lefties personally, um, but that's neither here nor there. So obviously if you know how I feel about a couple weeks ago, the Canadian open, um, but um, mm, the Bermuda grass greens, get back to the question. So these are just going to play not as spongy as what we think of down in Florida. Um, it is very hot and humid there, but because of the sand-based soil, they can make them super firm and they'll make them a little bit less grainy. They can't go crazy fast with them because if they do, then balls are just going to be rolling off into the abyss like nonstop. And they have 156 golfers that have to get around that golf course for the first two days. So I, I would think of it more like that Poa Trovialis overseed that we see. And when, and you get those super pure greens that aren't super grainy. So if I was, if I was putting it into fantasy national, then I I would categorize it as, as one of those like a TPC sawgrass or like we've seen at uh, what's another golf course like that. Um, TPC Scottsdale, you know, one of those, it almost plays not, not as much like bent, but it's just not going to be as grainy as that Florida Bermuda. So you're going to end up seeing a more pure rule. Yes. hundred percent. Yeah. I, I, and, and you'll be able to do a lot of, a lot of, go back to your point about the creativity with short game. You're going to see a lot of skitter shots. You're going to see a lot of like um, really, really cool, low flighted, you know, like dart shots in where the guys like boom, 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 grabs. Um, you're going to see a lot of stuff like that because they're going to always be chipping from below the level of the surface. So the ball is going to have to come in low and they're going to have to be really aggressive. I mean, that's where they, like you really have to be good with a wedge hitting it off that tight. I mean, it's going to be tight, tight Bermuda all around those greens, which petrifies the average golfer. But that's the beauty of Ross. You know, like he preserves par. He makes it really hard to make birdie. But if you and I are hacking it around down there and we're in one of those swales, we put it up on, we two putt, it's a par four, we make five. Right. But those guys are trying to make birdie. So it's it, it's it's really, really cool how he does that. And um, it it I, I can't wait. I love when we go back to classic places like this that make these guys think I can't I can't at the risk of being redundant. I can't state that enough. You have got to have a great game plan here and you've got to be willing to be patient because you're going to get in that wire grass and get a bad break and you just got to let it go. Kind of like Cam Smith seems to like let everything just roll off his back like a duck and then just come up with some sort of wonder shot or, or like a Jordan and then just move on. What about Jordan? I mean, he's kind of the prototypical guy that you just talked about of yeah. like, is he just too bad with his irons now? I, I, because the scoring is going to be right around par, that gives him much more of a chance than it will when we got to go to 18 or 16 under because he's just not going to make that that many great approach shots. But since par is kind of like the eternal equalizer in a U.S. Open, he'll have more of a choice. But, you know, we talk about this all the time. We keep talking about Jordan like he hasn't won twice in seven years. <laughs> it's, you know, like um, – you know, I, I, I just, I just don't see it anymore. You know, like I, I really think his wrist is hurt. You know, I'm out there all the time, Pat, you know, that, um, I, you know, I, I will be at Muirfield village. I, you know, I was out there at Wells. I mean, I, I think that his wrist is really hurt and he, that's why his approach game, because think about it, right? He's great off the tee. He's Jordan off the tee. And why? Because that ball's not sitting on the ground. As soon as you place it on the ground and you make that collision with your lead wrist, which for him is your left wrist, Right. Now, all of a sudden, and he's going to go on one of the hardest surfaces that you're going to see that they're going to play on all year. You know, like, I I just don't see it. You got to pick it clean. And um, I, I think that that left wrist hurts him. And I, and I think that, therefore, I, I would just be turning the page on him. Uh, I mentioned Victor uh, a few moments ago about yeah. how he's had a lot of struggles chipping off of very tight lies better from really the deep rough, where maybe that's more of an equalizer. But dude can putt, dude can drive. The irons yeah. have come back. Do you like him here or do you think that 
this around the green. If he's not hitting every green in regulation and it's a U.S. Open, he's not yeah. going to hit every green in regulation. That it just might be too much for him. And like <laughs> bad, bad shots will be played on replay. So um, this is the beauty of golf betting. Right. Because you can almost talk yourself into anything like we could totally discount Victor because of the short game. But then he was T4 at that 150th Open Championship at St. Andrews. So how did that happen? Right. Was it because he hit every green? Well, it's much shorter. Yes. So like there's your caveat. Right. Like that's how we can figure out that T4 and and how he did. Um, I I think it's going to be really tough for somebody like that that has an average um, short game to really contend over the course of 72 holes. Uh, Valhalla was, was perfect for Victor long iron, mid iron play point and shoot, and then very opt- opportunistic putting, you know, I, I mean, I think Xander's super live here because Xander is a really, really good scrambler and he picks the ball. I mean, he's not a super digger, right? So like hitting off of these firm surfaces, isn't going to throw him for a loop at all. And he's so well-rounded. He has all those shots around the green and statistically we know throughout the year, he's equal to Scotty, if not better with a long iron in hand. So, uh, you know, in that range, you know, he's definitely somebody I'd be talking about. And and there's definitely, you know, there's some other guys in there, whether it be a Wyndham or a Victor or somebody like that, that I'd, I'd have way more concerns about that are going to be, you know, maybe they're not in that price range, but who's going to be there. Brooks is going to be there, which of course he, in, in what, 2014, he was in the top 10. Um, but I'm not sure Brooks' short game is as good as, as what it needs to be in order to win. And like Rom will be up there as well, but I have no idea where Ooh. his game is at at the moment. Like I'll dig into this more in the later part of this show, but I, I was trying yep. to think of just sort of the player that you described. I want to talk about Bryson for a second, because I just think Bryson's yep. short game is kind of disastrous a lot of the time because he's going to come in with the right strategy. Or at least I don't know if it's going to be right or not. He's going to pick a strategy. And sometimes yes. that really works to his advantage. Sometimes it doesn't. But we saw at Augusta, the short game got the best of him the moment it wasn't super wet out anymore. And when he had to play a creative shot, that's just not his style. Like he just, he he can't play it off the mound over there and get it to roll down. Even at that open championship you were talking about, he finished inside the top 10. But again, it was yep. just, I'll drive five of the greens on the course. Not a problem. Yeah. Um, so the, the whole thing with Bryson, and when you go to a place like this or like Augusta National, um, his, his, his chipping clubs are the size of a six iron hat. So like, imagine like you, you're trying to have that much touch and control on a 40 foot pitch or something like that. And th- that thing is that long in your hands with that super huge grip that he uses. And the lie angle is so it, it, it's so vertical and it's so much higher than anyone else's wedge would be it really limits the versatility that he has. It's almost a credit to him that he even comes close in some of those events because he's working with tools that are like actually make it harder. So as much as Bryson would be a huge factor in this and he'll have tons of experience there, he'll play in the North South. I mean, he's that good of a player. Like he'll know the golf course and and he'll, it's just, you're right. I mean, I, I have to agree with, you know, like I'm not agreeing with you. I'm just saying like, you know, you can't chip with a six iron. You know, even if it does have 56 degrees aloft, it's just like that. You're just making it harder for harder sake. No one's going to ever accuse Bryson of being on the all hands team when it comes to this. So (laughs) like the the guys that you've described who aren't the the greatest players in the world. I mean, maybe you do consider them to be the greatest players in the world. Like Hideki, one of the first names that springs to mind. If Justin Thomas could putt or drive the ball, like he would be on that list. Like he does, you know, if it's wedges around the green, he might miss every two foot putt, but he's another one that immediately springs to mind. Fleetwood is another one too. Oh yeah. Fleetwood for sure would be very live. You know, just look at him at, at Shittacock a couple of years ago when he lost to Brooks. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I think you have to build out from the green. How can you score at Pinehurst? How can you be a great scorer? And you know, obviously put Scotty aside, you figure out whatever you want to do with him from a betting <laughs> capacity, but like, You know, like it's how can you score there? Because, you know, this is a faders golf course. Uh, What, 10 of the tee shots work left to right. Uh, So, you know, a guy hits a nice little power fade, puts it out there, um, is above average. Give him a B with his approach game. But he is an A or an A plus with his short game. And he's at least an A minus with the putter. And boy, that guy is super live. And there will be some there will be some randos definitely coming up there. I don't know if they'll be as random as Eric Compton, uh, but you know I guess the vignettes the, the the vignette makers will have their hands full when it comes to Sunday. But it's uh, 
It'll be it'll be pretty cool to see how this thing breaks down because there'll be a couple power guys there, but I think if you look at the top 10 when it's all said and done, there'll be more artists there than there will be just attackers. And you wouldn't consider this guy to be in that camp, although his stats have been firmly in that camp somehow over the past two months or so. And all of a sudden, formerly the best iron player in the world, has started to hit his irons well again. And he is a fader yeah. of the ball. He hits every fairway. He's increased his distance. And now he can chip and putt. He's won two majors. He has two top tens in majors. It's Colin Morikawa. Yeah, I mean, I know... Oh, I know your history, and I know you love Colin, and I know you love but he, Betty he Colin. Chips now. Where did this yeah. come from? Um, well, he went back to his old coach, right? So similar to like Davis Riley going back to Radar out there, Jeff Smith in Vegas. And, uh, you know, so Colin goes and works with Mark Blackburn, who is obviously one of the top five instructors in the world. The guy's great, but they just didn't mesh. He goes back to Rick Sessinghouse, and all of a sudden he's starting to find the things that made him Colin Morikawa again. And he's he would be, in my mind, well, a year ago, you and I would both agree. We'd say, there's no way that guy can't chip and putt his way around this place in order to do it. But now all of a sudden to me, it seems like this guy was a British Open champion and, or sorry, Open Championship winner. And, you know, it certainly fits. And we remember that last day, he had a couple of great up and downs, a couple of great putts um, in order to preserve that victory and hold on and, you know, and win the Claret Jug um, I think in that range where you're going to find the odds for him and you're going to see your Cam Smiths and you're going to see your Brysons and those guys and your Victors, I, I think definitely he is he is more live of somebody that is in that echelon uh, because of going back to Rick and because of his ability now with the short game. Um, I kind of, you know, I kind of like that. I mean, he's like the perfect guy to win a uh, player's championship. Right. Like if you thought about it, like over the course of his career, would it make sense to you if I said Colin will win a player's championship? I mean, as someone who bets him at Sawgrass every year, yes, I, I would hope so, because I'm just going to be down like 10 grand by the time my life is over on him. Yeah, I mean, he he just he just suits that so well. And um, yeah, I'm excited for Colin because I think he does very something very unique with Rick. Rick is not just his swing coach, but he's also his mental coach. And I think that this is. This is definitely going to be a mental test. And I, I think even just like, you know, Scotty no longer being a, you know, a possible, an alleged felon <laughs> is a big weight off his shoulders and and he'll be able to attack more. You know, it, it, it'll be interesting to see how everything plays out leading up into this, because as much as Wells Fargo was a huge um, indicator for what we would see at Valhalla. Uh, and of course, look at the way the leaderboard worked out, right? You know, Xander played well and there he was you know, and he goes and he wins the PGA, uh, Muirfield Village doesn't have a lot to do with what, what we're really going to, you and I would be focusing on and our world would be focusing on leading into, you know, Piners number two. So the last few guys I want to kind of run by you that okay. obviously they're going to have deficiencies in some sort of category, but just from you being able to see them out there, okay. is Taylor Moore a real guy who just can't hit an approach shot, but he's great at everything else? Yeah, I mean... You know, if they looked a little bit more alike, he'd be just like Mac Hughes, you know, like those guys could scramble out of a garbage can, but like, you know, you never know where the approach shot's going to go, uh, which is interesting. And it goes to show you, you put them in the right place. Um, they can contend. Um, but yeah, he's a real guy. Um, he's been impressive all year and, you know, cause he really slumped um, last summer and uh, to see him come back. Uh, I think he's made every cut this year right? 13 or 14 in a row. So um, Taylor Moore's a real guy. And with his level of short game and the way he drives it, eh, reasonably viable. So he has top so, 20s of both majors so far this season, which yeah. you'd be very surprised about for a guy, again, who just doesn't hit irons at all. But uh, for his level, an elite driver, and compared to Mac Hughes, a much better driver than Mac Hughes. Oh, about yeah, definitely. E yeah. Uh, about equal in terms of the approach game. But Fantastic around the greens and generally like he doesn't get quite the magic beans that Mac Hughes can get from time to time, but he just makes a lot of putts. That's kind of his entire thing. I was trying to think about like what courses that we may have seen some of these C level and D level players play at against maybe some of the top end guys. And like, yeah, they're all at the players and we can point to that. But like, where's another spot? What did you make of the course in Houston? in terms of how the around the green is going to go, because that felt like just watching it, that the lot of runoff areas, a lot of just like very high up greens where 
the types of shots that you said that you would have to play from around the green and the variability of what you can do, would that lend any credence there where maybe guys that were good around the green there could be a re- very good around the green here too? Or am I just like, it's not a 1v1 type thing? I mean, from length and 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 I'll give you a 50-50 on that. I think that, you know, the golf course there in Houston, that public, the, the Muni course there, uh, yeah, I think that's a pretty good pull. I, I think that you get a good cross section there. Um, Doak did a good job there. He Doak would definitely be somebody that has a lot of Ross influence in his design work. Um, golly, they just play so many places on tour where you know it's just such aerial architecture where they just point and shoot, they hit it in the air, and then if it runs off somewhere, then it it you know then it hits you know the the um the long grass and it just sits there, you know, along the fringe, if there's one cut or two cut or whatever it may be. Um, th- there'll be a lot of the country club here. So if you go back to Fitz's U S open, there'll be a lot of that, a lot of the ground game. Um, there are, there just aren't, there's so many, I mean, there'll be a lot of like the way they had to play at colonial. Um, that will be very similar. You know, it's interesting. You bring that up about Taylor Moore having two top twenties in majors. You know, he is the type of player that, that, that gets the most out of his rounds when I watch him play, whereas there are so many guys out there that get the like the absolute least out of their rounds all Rory. the time because they can't, yeah, because they can't putt or or so on and so forth, right? Um, I, I mean, if Rory can't get the long left irons out of his game, like he is going to be in pain at Pinehurst. Like it's and he's so talented that he'll probably still make the cut, but the cut's tough there, you know. Like, and I'm sure you go over all these details, but you know, top sixty in ties with no ten shot rule. Um, it's one of the tougher, tougher cuts in, you know, professional golf. Um, I'm just trying to, I mean, the, what, what Gil did there at colonial would be very similar Southern Hills, the country club. Um, I oh mean, you know, a lot of those, the, the, um, so Keegan Bradley. Yeah. Country club colonial. I mean, he was inside, he was fourth here last time they played it 10 years ago and like, no one's riding a better driving and iron streak right now i mean yes he doesn't quite put himself out of tournaments like he used to but he does have a much improved short game he's a really good pitcher of the golf ball so chipping just think of that as like a bump and run shot where someone's green side and they bump it on and it rolls out like a putt he's a really like underrated ch- uh, pitcher of the golf ball so that's like now we're 30 yards out and we're going to choose the flight we're going to hit it in with spin we're going to hit it in with some trajectory choices and we have to find a landing spot and everything and, you know, just look at his pre-shot routine. The guy's super detail-oriented. He's, you know, he's probably some form of OCD. So, you know, like going to a place like this where he's going to need a very, very strict game plan. I mean, look how good he was at Aronimink when he won there. You know, and it, that played soft that week, but like that's Donald Ross too. I mean, like as he evolved as a designer, but like, I mean, a lot of those themes are going to be the same. I mean, he has the most creative green complexes. Everybody that's a modern architect that we love their work, it all stems from this guy doing 400 plus golf courses throughout the course of his career. And he really makes you use the ground. And that's what makes bogey almost at times easier than trying to make birdie. And the guys that we see play golf, and we don't see enough of these golf courses. um, It's a great question for comps. Um, yeah, I, I struggle because everything's like TPC, which is like, you know, T- well, it's, point, it's funny because we're not mentioning you know? Wyndham or Detroit or even East, like, like the Ross courses that we normally see, because it just doesn't feel like it'd be the same. Does it? No, it definitely wouldn't. I mean, those things are, um, I mean, even like Detroit, where it seems like they're turtleback greens and everything, but like, th- there's a lot of uniques about Pinehurst number two that Ross Ross was just, he was just a genius when it came to the landscape that he was given. And then he would put something there that just looked like it fit. So if you and I walked up to the first tee at Detroit, we'd say, oh, wow, look at this. And then if we went down to the, you know, down there to North Carolina, we went to Wyndham, we'd be all like, oh, look, you know, like this seems like it fits too. Oh, it's, you're telling me it's the same designer. Oh, um, all right. Well, there's a couple false fronts and they'll, you'll come up with some similarities between the two, but you're, you're really kind of grasping at straws. Like Ross was just so good at using the landscape and and what do you have here in the sand hills because you don't have a, you don't have a ton of topography changes right so he really works with the soil and 
you know what you're going to get a lot of holes where you hit it left to right off the tee and they're, they're called switchbacks and then you have to hit it right to left into the green because the green sits at a funny angle and then they're going to put the pins in places and they'll know exactly where to do this that that causes you to have to hit certain style of shots and if you're not good at hitting the ball both ways then then you you're you're going to be chipping a lot because those greens will just reject balls if they're hidden coming in the wrong direction and that will cause even more short game work. Um, and if that's not your, if that's not your, uh, that's not your strength, then you're really going to be in trouble, but it's, it's super cool. Like the eighth hole, the way the fairway sits and, and you have to land the ball into the can. It's the you know, like, you see that like a place like Olympic and stuff like that, where they're on the side of a hill, this place is flat and you have to do that, which, which is really going to lead to a lot of these balls rolling out. There's no edges to the fairways, right? This isn't Oak Hill. There's not like a barrier of four inches of rough, right? These balls will just roll wherever, which is like, Good luck. I'll leave you with this. And I think what I'm going to do is just like sort by sawgrass and work backwards from there. Because that does seem to be the one, at least with the most crossover success, whether it's exactly the same. I think that we've discussed there are elements uh, of that potentially being the same. That there is the one guy. Okay. Does Thigala have a chance here? Or is he just too, are the misses too big when he misses? I almost think it's more of a pressure thing. It seems like every time that he becomes chatter on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, he doesn't top 10. And um, golly, I mean, his the weakest part of his game as he's improved over the last year, his ball striking. I mean, his ball striking has been impeccable this year, which is why he's come up with now, what, five top 10s. But his short game has really lacked. And he's, I mean, when he was at Pepperdine and he won college player of the year, I mean, that was his strength, his short game and his putter. And he's made his ball. It's it's almost a shame. It's like he's made his ball striking so good if that short game was still there. But if you start running models on Fantasy National, it, his numbers are they're going to be red with a wedge in his hand. And I don't know that he's a good enough ball striker like a Keimer was in his prime to just putt all the time and get up and down. Um, he, he does putt all. He does putt all the time. That he does. <laughs> yeah, and I think it has a lot to do with the fact that his short game has been a huge weakness this season. And the places that he plays well at are places that aren't necessarily, you have to be that creative, a la, like you were saying about Victor Hovland, you don't have to be that creative with a wedge. So when we think about who has won here in the past, obviously Payne Stewart won three times ago, yeah. Michael Campbell beat Tiger by two, and then Martin Keimer wins. Keimer was you know, a great player in the world. He had just won the Players' Championship earlier that year, but it was this was still a time of he was not one of the top five guys on the betting board obviously michael campbell was what like five million to one the year that he won is pinehurst a good place for a long shot do you think um only because there's going to be some luck involved so i i think as much as i I just call it luck because it could always be good luck or it could be bad luck pat um, you're going to get some weird lies in that wire grass. And if you luck out like Keimer and it's all good luck, then you definitely have a chance to outpace the field. But if you get a couple of bad breaks and they're going to happen and they're going to happen from good golf shots, how you handle that mentally and then your approach from there, but then your ability to make a bogey out of a double bogey is going to be tremendous. So that level of luck is, is to answer your question, um, point blank. Yes. We are going to have a chance to have somebody that's in triple digits win this thing because um, things can get sideways quick, you know, and and I know saying that, you know, Scotty's obviously the one <laughs> and he probably wins by five. But if somebody gets close to him and there's a bad break coming down the stretch, um, you know, it, it's just you, you have to be. Uh, you have to be lucky in a U.S. Open, which, I mean, we could go on and do a whole nother show on the USGA running these events, but um We'll keep it positive for the time being. And we'll just say that, yes, I, I think that you're going to get some live wires at, at the top of the leaderboard. Um, it could be as random again as Eric Compton, Jason Gore, guys like that, that, you know, great players that all of a sudden they just popped because things went their way that week. And you could definitely get some positive roles at Pinehurst. So just write it down. Henley, Harris, English, Denny, Harris, Dietrich Harris is a good one. Just, just, these are all the guys that I'll just end up losing money on this week. Anyway, I'm going to dig more into the research on Fantasy National here in a second. Keith Stewart, read the line. Tell everyone what you got going on pre-tournament and what you're going to be doing in the tournament when you're there on the grounds. So leading up to that week, um, 
you can always go to readtheline.com. That's where I house all of my content. So whether it's on all the stuff that I do for Golf Digest or Sports Grid or any of the other podcasts that I'm on, you can always just go there. So go readtheline.com. If you're if I'm new to you because I'm here with Pat, then please go check it out and subscribe. You can sub subscribe for free. Um, if you think that I do a decent job, I picked 30 winners in the last 30 months. I cover the LPGA and the PGA Tour on site and I'm a PGA professional. So I, I bring golf to golf betting and I try to make it as fun as possible. I'm like, if if Pat's a, a 10 on the entertainment value and accuracy and everything else that he does. Accuracy. Maybe, maybe, dog, you, you don't need to butter me up when you're on the line. You can say Pat's picks are dog shit. It's fine. <laughs> but I don't know. I mean, it's been, it's been an interesting year. I mean, it tested us all. Much like Piners is going to test these guys in the wire grass, the first seven weeks, I mean, I think we were all were, we all were on the ledge, you know? So it's, um, hey, if, if if we're having fun, if you and I are having fun, we're smiling and people are enjoying golf betting, then as a PGA pro, you know, with all due respect to Greg Norman, I'm growing the game. So that's what I love to do. So check me out. Let's get into the course breakdown powered by fantasynational.com. Obviously, you have the chance to win one of two Fantasy National annual memberships by getting in that draw by joining Underdog Fantasy with code Mayo, getting a deposit bonus of up to 250 bucks, and rating and reviewing the Pat Mayo Experience audio podcast. If not, and you just want to get in and do your own research, do your own research. That's what the internet tells me. And those are the most right people out there according to a vast minority on the internet. Either way, fantasynational.com slash mayo to get yourself in. I've already built out the model and the mixed condition model, but I want to talk about the breakdown of the course to begin with. So we have Pinehurst Resort number two. I've already went over a little bit of the different factors, you know, the, the new grass type since the last time the championship was played, a little bit of the redesign. Obviously, Keith and I talked this through. But what I really want to get to here is to look how the field actually got the job done at the U.S. Open in 2014, because that's all the data we really have for this. Dominate on the par fives. If you don't dominate on the par fives, you have very little chance. You need to be a little bit above the field, obviously, on par fours and par threes. Tread water there, score as much as you can on par fives. There's only two of them on the course, but if you're not making birdies, or even potentially eagles, as now in 2014, number five had almost a 4% eagle rate uh, and a birdie or a birdie percentage of 32%. So this is the key hole. If you are parring this hole, like 48% of the field does, it's going to be a rough day for you because you see a lot of red in terms of the bogey department on the screen in terms of doubles or worse. There's not a ton of doubles or worse, but like 6%, 5%. That is a lot in the grand scheme of things, especially when a hole is playing to a 27% bogey rate, a 31% bogey rate. The par three, number six hole, the really long one plays to a 34% bogey rate and a 3% double or worse rate. 2% birdie rate. So par is such a good score at this course. And I don't think that really changes this time around. But if you're not getting the strokes on the par five, you're absolutely screwed for the week. We don't have the actual proximity data from 2014 because that was USGA owned. They just never released it. So thanks for nothing, pals. The cut line in 2014 was plus six. But this is what I found really interesting. And it didn't occur to me until I really started digging into the stats. Fantasynational.com slash Mayo. 20% off any membership level. Get you everything you see here. And the leaderboard app, which won't be the most functional for the US Open because the US PGA is very secretive about their feeds, but anything after that for regular PGA Tour events, you're going to want that leaderboard. Driving accuracy, 70% in 2014, well above the PGA Tour average. This is very reminiscent to what we are seeing this week at Memorial. Guys are hitting a ton of fairways, although we didn't cash our ticket based off of one missed fairway too many with Xander Shoffley on Thursday's round, if you go look at the numbers that Tambo and I were getting on Thursday, or sorry, on Wednesday morning in terms of fairways hit and what they ended up being over the weekend, we were two, two and a half fairways below. So we had the right idea. We just happened to pick Xander Shoffley, who I think hit it into six fairway bunkers off the tee, not something normally that he was going to do. So we picked the wrong guy. The process was right. So there are some exploitable edges if you can get on it a bit early. That might be the key this week as well. We'll see when the underdog dog fantasy props for driving accuracy end up coming out but i thought this number was shocking it's not to say it's going to play exactly the same 10 years later but i just would have figured it was a lot 
smaller than that. And that goes hand in hand with what I said earlier about the width of the fairway. The problem is once you're not on the fairway, you're screwed. It's not like there's a whole bunch of rough laying around for your ball to sit up in. No, it's not going to happen. So even if you do hit the fairway, the green regulation percentage is still way down and the scrambling percentage is way down. So you can spin that one of two ways. Really, you could say, hey, you need elite scramblers, elite short game players, and that is what's going to get you through. Now, that's the place where I lean a little bit more. Of course, you're always going to have your outliers. And we re-examine the leaderboard from 2014. You see, especially from like places 10 to 20, a lot of guys that are very good around the green. Short hitters, accuracy players, and great scramblers. The other way that you could spin this is... You, know, you can take the Texas wedge, as we've talked about many of times. There's myriad ways that you can play some of your shots from around the green. So what does that mean? It means that maybe it's a bit of an equalizer in a sense where maybe some of the crappier around the green players. I mean, I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, I mean, it could if guys commit to actually testing out something different than they normally do, but maybe that is an equalizer. Like a lot of people say that po Poana greens, especially on the West Coast, can be an equalizer because of the bumpy greens. It means your crappier putters just might luck into making more putts, where the truer the line, the better the putter is going to end up doing. And, you know, you're always going to have, you know, great putters who putt poorly on some of those services, bad putters who putt great. And uh, one chip in skews the stats a little bit too for around the green stuff. So there's always going to be that outlier. When you take a look at the median numbers, I do think it's going to benefit the highly skilled players around these greens. Three putts aplenty, uh, almost one per round per player, which you know, this is the PGA Tour. This isn't playing with Pat Mayo out here. I'm, I'm having like five or six around. So higher than your average PGA Tour event by almost double. Not quite double, but almost double the amount of three putts per round. And taking a back, look back at U.S. Open history and in 2000 and night or 2014, sorry. So we see over the past five years, Rory, Rom, Xander, Scotty, and Hideki have been the five best U.S. Open players in terms of overall strokes gain total. Now, Scotty's probably actually a bit better than that because he didn't play in the 2021 U.S. Open. He has three consecutive top sevens. Rory's finished top 10 at the U.S. Open each of the past five years. He was T24, I believe, uh, when they played this in 2014. Xander coming off a major win. He's actually got progressively, not progressively worse, but he's been worse the last two years, meaning that he's only finished inside the top 15, not the top 10 uh, overall. Other guys that have been very good good. Even DJ continues to be good at U.S. Opens. He was fourth in 2014. Morikawa continues to play U.S. Opens really well. He's been inside the top 15 each of the past three years. Other guys with notable Bryson has just made the cut every single year. Again, this is the hardest cut to make in golf. Top 60 in ties, a field of 156. Harris English has three top 10 finishes in the past four years, if you're just looking at the normal setup. Now, when I pondered this with Keith, that maybe this won't be exactly the same. A lot of the names that we've seen kind of pop up are the guys that you would expect to do well at US Open. So when I get to the mixed condition model in a little bit, I do have US Open history baked into a minimal degree, just in case you know I'm a bit off on that. We see Brooks Koepka didn't play in 2000. 21, a second, a fourth, a 55th, and a T17 a year ago when it was played at LA Country Club. Uh, we'll see how he ends up finishing in Live Golf Houston over the weekend. Rom had a very hot start there. Keimer, first round leader. Maybe it is time for Party Marty to defend his title and get himself into a U.S. Open for the next decade because his exemptions for the U.S. Open are up after this season. So you can just see there's just a bunch of guys who end up doing pretty well. Cam Smith, his bin boomer bus was very good at LA Country Club. Ricky Fowler was obviously very good at LA Country Club. Will LA Country Club have any correlation to Pinehurst? I have no idea. Probably not. Just be looking at the courses, they don't seem to have very many similarities. Denny has been very good at the past two U.S. Opens. T7 at Brookline, T20 last year. And listen, he's going to be a very good scrambler. You would expect him. The one problem is, and this is one of the guys who kind of screwed us on our eight-leg play on underdog over on Thursday, was his fairways just haven't been good. You think that Denny, he's, he's got to play this accuracy game. And overall, like it's pretty decent. But when you're only gaining strokes on the field for accuracy half the time, yet you are losing on distance every single week, that is a bad 
formula. Now, his iron play has been a little bit better, which is nice, but if he's going to start getting himself in the shit, that's not going to be good. You can see last year, kind of going from the playoffs all the way back, he had some events where he lost. I mean, he lost a ton of Genesis in terms of accuracy. Other than that, very marginal losses to the field, but generally gaining a whole bunch on accuracy. Like when he lost in the playoff at Memorial, you know, he's gaining on the field there at the U.S. Open last year, gaining a ton on the field. If he starts playing like this Denny, who every single week is trading back and forth, I think he had six fairways when everyone was hitting fairways Thursday at Mirfield Village. Like that's just not going to cut it. And the rest of his game is good enough. But even if he's just off by a degree, a little bit, then I think he's absolutely screwed. Like, you're just not going... We saw the three putts. They're double. I don't expect Denny to three putt, and maybe he can make it all back putting, but if he is not near the top of the field and chipping and putting, like, he has absolutely no chance of doing anything. So that's what I'd be looking at for tournament history overall. I do want to take back again to 2014 at the U.S. Open just to see if there's anything that we can glean about this leader. Because I've talked about it uh, a bunch at this point, but I haven't really shown you up on the screen what any of that means. If you're listening to the audio version to this, thank you. And if you are listening to the audio version, please subscribe, rate, and review while you're listening to it. It's the easiest time to do it. If you're watching the video, you can get yourself in the draws you know, for the 500 bucks, the split of the 50K, whatever it might be. By doing that, uh, even if you've done it before, please go do that again. But if you just switch over to the video, you can see yeah, it's an eight-stroke victory for Martin Keimer. And you know that that's a pretty large margin. I want a large march. It's the, it's the Pee Wee Herman U.S. Open right now. But the names are just so strange on this leaderboard. You have Fowler, Compton, Stenson, DJ, Day, Keegan, Brooks, then Snedeker, Scott, Jimmy Walker. Then you get into that range of player that I just talked about, where the shorter hitting great around the green: Kevin Na, Marcel Seam, Matt Kuchar, Jim Furyk, Ian Poulter, Todd Father, Spieth, Stricker. Horschel. Like these are high end accuracy players, good putters for the most part, and very good around the green. Graham McDowell is up there. Chris Kirk, Daniel Hauserberger, even with a third round 78 shot, 66. Jesus Christ, Daniel Berger. That's a nice, nice round four uh, at your U.S. Open in 2014. Probably his first U.S. Open at that. That must have been the round of the day. Let's see here. Round four, if we sort by round four. And we go down, let's see, yeah, 66, Daniel Berger, round of the day, Louis, Furyk, Keegan, Jason Day to all get themselves back up there, Fitz. So you can see the type of player that did really well, and we can dig a little bit deeper into driving accuracy and um, and driving distance over time, but you have Fowler, Compton, Stenson, not very, and I mean, Fowler probably was at the time. Keimer was about average, kind of like Morikawa in a weird way. Like slightly above average, very good at accuracy. Stenson and Compton, obviously short. DJ, Brooks, Day, Keegan, all very long. Same with Adam Scott and Jimmy Walker. Snedeker, Na, Kuchar, all very short off the tee, but a bit more accuracy-based. So you have a real mix of players. So how do we start to differentiate all these players? As I mentioned, Sawgrass. Sawgrass winner, Martin Keimer. Sawgrass winner, Ricky Fowler. Sawgrass winner, Henrik Stenson. Sawgrass winner, Jason Day. Sawgrass winner, Adam Scott. Sawgrass winner, Matt Kuchar. Jim Furyk ended up coming in second there. We had a second place for Jordan Spieth uh, at TPC Sawgrass. Brooks has a second place finish. Keegan has, I believe, a third place finish, as does Snedeker. So just... For whatever reason, these two places kind of cross paths. And that is another course where over time that you see bombers do really well, you see that shorter hitters do really well. And I think a lot of it just has to do with the strategy that you take off the tee uh, and how you want to play this course. If Bryson can figure out the right way and strategize properly to attack this course, he could be really good here. I just worry that he's going to grip it, rip it, and just not hit enough fairways. If he took iron off every tee and hit it straight, he might have a very, very good chance of competing at Pinehurst number two. So let's take a look at fairways gained. And you can see Keimer slightly above average in fairways, a lot on distance versus the field, which you just wouldn't expect. Fowler and Compton were actually below. And Keith and I talked a little bit about the luck factor. That's going to end up having to be a key. And you see with some of these bigger hitters, they lost slightly to the field. Like DJ lost a ton to the field in fairways. But everyone else was kind of right around even, or they were gaining a bunch off distance. Like someone like Keegan, I think gained the most distance of anyone in the field. 
Oh, no, it was Lindheim, J.B. Holmes, Keegan Bradley, Dustin Johnson. And you can see some of these other guys end up getting propped up a little bit, like Keimer, who was way up in driving distance, mainly because he hit so many fairways. And you get so much more of that rollout. Hunter Mahan was up there, Paul Casey, Gary Woodland. So Hideki, even at the time, was a shorter player who was better with his fairways, ended up leading, uh, gaining on the field a little bit with his fairways, ends up gaining on distance. So there's many ways to go about this. Um, I do think that fairways do mean more than driving distance for the week, and that might not necessarily play itself out perfectly. You can see Lucas Glover, you know, gained a distance and fairways, can't chip or putts. So that's a real problem. Even gaining greens and regulation for the week versus everyone. We take a look at greens and regulation. How did we do there? Even that wasn't the end-all be-all. You don't see Martin Keimer up there at all in terms of greens and regulation. He gained on the field, but he's outside of the top 20 for the week in greens and regulation game because it comes down realistically because the putting can be so difficult depending where you are on the green that maybe it's three putts abound it's all about can you make your putts inside 10 feet can you scramble around this place that's going to be the big differentiator and those are the types of players that you want to end up having we'll take a look at the i mean we won't have proximity gain that's the problem with this birdies and bogeys gained for the week bogeys avoided Best players in the field, Martin Keimer, Jason Day, Ricky Fowler. One, four, and two on the leaderboard. So, I mean, obviously that shouldn't come as a big shock to anyone that avoiding bogeys is going to do you a whole world of good at a U.S. Open. But, I mean, it strictly comes through. Now, bogeys avoided a lot of the time. Bogey avoidance isn't necessarily a predictive stat. It's more of a storytelling stat, a lot like war in baseball, where it will tell you, based on how the players played so well, like bogey avoidance will be very good for this. You see some guys just didn't didn't have it. So it was kind of a combination outside of Jason Day of bogeys avoided and birdies gained on the field on some of these more difficult holes. Even someone like the Todd father was able to do that. And you see the guys that actually lost. Outside of Jason Day, you have Chris Kirk, who was very high in bogey avoidance, but was in the minus for birdies gained, ends up coming 28th. He's not near the top of the leaderboard. Kevin Stadler, you know, one of the best players, top 10 in bogeys avoided, top five, actually, tied five for bogeys avoided for the week, lost almost four strokes to the field in birdies, ended up coming 63rd. You're still going to have to make your birdies because everyone's going to make bogeys. Everyone in this field is going to make bogeys. So it just comes down to, can you make enough birdies to end up treading water? It's no different than a round that I played the other day. I ended up making four doubles in the round, very few bogeys, but I ended up with four birdies throughout the course of the round. Like that, You can make your doubles when you're like a crap player like me and you're right around a 10 handicap, like making four birdies in a round just covers up so many mistakes and you end up shooting 80 or 79 or 81 or whatever it is. When normally, when you're not making those birdies to go along with it, all of a sudden, I mean, obviously that's the case, but when you're just putting up double bogeys on the card, you can kind of feel that same way about pros and how bogeys really do affect their round. If you can't balance that out, I mean, that's really the Sheffler thing. Like Sheffler's going to make a bunch of bogeys this week i mean if he doesn't then really watch out but even when he does it makes like three in a round or something like that he's one of the few players that you can actually feel good about gaining birdies on the field he'll you know, beat up on the par fives he's not going to let those go to waste he's going to birdie a few of the difficult par fours hell i mean he chips in so goddamn often he might birdie the very difficult par threes like he'll make the, up the difference somewhere else and those are the types of players that you want and you see a lot of these guys in the birdies gain category outside of keimer day great short game great short game for fowler nah snediger jimmy walker chris kirk stands some pretty bad short game dj somewhere around the middle same as Brendan Todd, or, uh, Adam Scott, Brendan Todd, very good. David Toms, very good. Cooch, very good. Aaron Badley, very good. Zach Johnson, very good. Uh, these guys are also very, very good wedge players as well. Something else, I wish we had the proximity stats from the year we don't. I bet you with this range from like 75 to 100, it, 75 to like 150-ish is going to be a very good range to look at for a lot of players beyond around the green, whether it be layups on par fives. If you get yourself stuck in the shit off the fairway, then you need to lay up a little bit. That's always been sort of a key indicator at U.S. Opens. Let's talk about the stat model. I've already built it out. We can make amends to it, though. You can see it's loaded in right now. Pinehurst. It's not for number three. It's not for number four. It's for Pinehurst number two. 
but you really don't need to worry about that. I have driving distance weighted more than fairways game, but they are both in a cumul uh, summation of 20% inside the model for the week. 11 and 9% approach, 20% proximity gained, 200% bogeys avoided, 11%. I'm going to boost that up a little bit. Putting 5 to 10, 10 to 15 feet, 9 apiece around the green overall, 15%. Sand saves 5. I am going to throw in, now that I've talked that through a little bit, I'm going to add not birdies gained, because again, I think that's more of a storytelling stat in a lot of ways, although I have included bogey avoidance within this. I think I'm pretty comfortable with that. I like that better than scrambling in a lot of ways, but that's just a preference for me. Maybe if you are a member at Fantasy National, you can put in birdies gained or scrambling, but I'm going to go proximity 75 to 100. I'm not going to weight these a ton. I just kind of want to see them as it comes out in the modeling. Uh, so 75 to 100 yards, 100 to 125. We'll just give them little mini weightings, probably more than 1%. We'll go 2%, 3% for those, and it'll just bump down everything else. Now, instead of 11 and 9% for distance and fairways, we have 10 and 8%. Like, it's not that big of a difference. Uh, obviously, you can see it up on the screen. I'll try to include it, if I can remember, into the free newsletter, which you can subscribe to down in the description right now, or just go to Substack, Mayo Media. Uh, I'll probably have one coming out on Sunday evening. I usually try to do three during the week of majors just to keep you up to date on all the shows that are coming out, the giveaways, and all of the information that you might need. So looking back on the past 24 rounds overall within the Pinehurst model, a lot of the guys that Keith and I have talked about. Obviously, this is going to set up, set up every course sets up greatly for Scotty Scheffler, but he still rates out number one over the past 24 rounds. Scotty, Xander, Rory, the top three on the betting board are the top three in the tw past 24 round modeling. Hideki is number four. Hideki's actually playing all right at Memorial. I needed to see something out of him in order for him to come back because the last two tournaments he had played previous to Memorial were the PGA Championship and the Masters. It's been like three months. Dude's played two tournaments. So maybe he's finally healthy and coming back. I'm recording this on a Saturday before he has started his round. But if we just take a look at Hideki Matsu Yama at Memorial, and we take a look at his stats, we are going to see that he is 21st off the tee through two rounds. I mean, it's a field of 71, mind you. He's 12th around the green. He's inside the top 20 for approach, 38th in putting for the week. So I think that for the first time we've seen him get his tee to green act a little bit back together. Now, maybe he falls apart on the weekend. I have no idea. But another way you can do this on Fantasy Nationals, we'll just go to the odds for Memorial. Uh, and once you are actually on that tournament, you can go to live stats and we can check out what is uh, going on amongst all of the peoples for all the rounds. So we can take a look at how everyone is doing and we'll go to strokes gain total. You know, Scotty's in first place, obviously. How are they all doing it? Everyone's kind of gaining on the greens except for Siwoo. I mean, I, I know Keith disagreed with me about Siwoo. I still like him a lot this week. Maybe there's just a chance that he's able to putt. Maybe. Just maybe. You can see the ball striking for Morikawa is still very good for two rounds. But here's Hideki. So in total, T to green, 3.7 strokes. Ball striking, 2.2 strokes. So when we take a look at the overall T to green, you know, Scotty, Victor, the Gala playing really well. Can't drain a putt to save his life. Very encouraging to see his around the green game go so well. Because you don't normally see putting this bad from Sahith at all. So maybe sneaky under the radar a little bit based off his performance this week. We'll see how that translates into popularity in the DraftKings game or the betting market. But I know Vincenzi really liked him on the player-by-player -player show, if you haven't checked that out yet. Hadwin, Straka, I mean, I got money on Straka, I got money on Hovland. Hopefully one of these two jabronis can end up get going. And if Straka could just make some putts, he's like not significantly off the very top of the board in terms of ball striking and tee to green. His tee to green game has been excellent so far this week. He's just dropped two strokes putting. Brian Harmon's tee to green game is mainly chipping and approach play for Brian Harmon, at least through the two rounds, which is something that, as long as he's hitting fairways, is going to be very good because you wouldn't expect him at Pinehurst to end up losing four strokes putting. We take a look back at that leaderboard that I talked about a little bit earlier. Like, this is the Brian Harmon zone right here. Not that I, I, I'm trying to go out of my way not to bet Brian Harmon at a U.S. Open. I mean, he just did win a major. I don't expect him to win another one this time soon. But when you see names like Snedeker, Nah, Kuchar, Furyk, Poulter, Todd, like that is the Brian Harmon zone. He's like the good, he's probably the equivalent of what Matt Kuchar was in 2014, to be perfectly honest. And, you know, that's a guy who just 
finished really good <laughs> at a U.S. Open in 2014 at this course. So there are some different players out there who can kind of do this. It's weird to see Ludwig, but Ludwig seems like he's turning it around a little bit. It seems like the knee injury is not bothering him quite as much. Lowry playing well. Cam Davis playing well outside of the short game. Lowry obviously losing strokes putting, but that's just par for the course for old Shane Lowry. Horschel putting pretty well. Keegan's just like dominating. I think believe he is leading in putting for all players. Yeah, let's see. Uh, putting wise, yeah, the only one who's passed him is Putnam because he's actually started his round today as I'm looking for. And these other guys have not. So at the beginning of this through two rounds, it was Keegan, Poston, and Xander. Xander's actually really off in terms of his tee to green. And Day is someone else that like Day is just kind of all over the place. You know, the off the tee is bad. The approach is bad. He's having a really good third round and the putting has been off the charts good. I do think that Jason Day, I mean, this might be the end of me for this week if this actually ends up happening but you can see that his tee to green and putting on saturday at least through nine holes has been very good for jason day i just think that he has the right temperament for pinehurst um obviously he came inside the top five last time around but overall i think that day's chipping and putting is something that we're going to look at and be like yeah that's kind of what he does although he has not been doing it so much recently but around the green three five putting three four 1.55. 1.55. He hasn't lost strokes putting since the Genesis in February. And overall, he is doing very well around the green. Now, he didn't at some of the key places that I'm looking at, like Heritage. Uh, I don't have any colonial stats because obviously he didn't play there. But we'll see when I get to the mixed condition model that I mixed in some of those things. So just some guys who are playing well right now over the weekend in the Memorial. Uh, just, you know, you can go back and check out on Fantasy National or on the app a little bit later on. So here's what the model rankings give us over the past 24 rounds. We got Scheffler, Xander, Rory, as mentioned, then Hideki, Aaron Rye, Brooks, Ludwig, Tommy, Henley, Glover. There is the top 10. Denny, Bezadenhout, Morikawa, DJ, McClure, Messenger at number 15. Akshay Batia at number 19. North Carolina guy, too. Maybe it's his time. You won't be able to see him coming on the leaderboard. Norin, Bryson, Finau, Connors, and Homa Fitz, Taylor Moore. And it's going to be down for Taylor Moore after, I think he was like 82 or something. Friday at Memorial. Dietrich, number 25. Siwoo, Matthews, Harmon, Hoagie. And then Justin Thomas, Cam Smith, and Taylor Pendrith. So these are a lot of the guys that I'm looking at. Uh, and that's just the past 24 rounds. We can shrink this down to different levels of you know past 12 rounds i think rory boosts up to number one if i do 12 yeah because he's played so well recently but it's still the top three of rory xander scheffler but then it's ben and hideki keegan rye drops down a little bit morikawa makes a jump a lot of the same names thomas takes a huge boost from 31 to 40 the shorter term that we go hatton all of a sudden appears inside the top 20 so does kitayama norin remains around the same glover gets a little bit worse and here we have tom kim he's a coming he went goes from like 80 to 21st in the short term big ups for cam smith pendrith goes up sungjay goes up lowry goes up all of a sudden here's seb straka coming on up fitzpatrick harris english the burmista mista lady uh mcclellan ends up uh, falling about half of his spots when we go to the short-term version of all of this now we can also use the rolling model for pinehurst we'll let that go in we don't want we want the pinehurst model in order to load itself in so we can take a look from four to the past 100 rounds and see what we have out you can see that everything 10 15 20 22 so i've built it as a bit of a pyramid for the rolling model at pinehurst with four being the lowest but 50 and 100 being 15 each 12 and 24 being the two highest represented and eight being the same as 50 and 100 so i want to get that medium short term type of feeling for the pinehurst model and we put all of those ranges together xander scotty Rory, Hideki, Rye. Those are still the big ones that we're going with. They remain the top five. However, you see some of the big ones jump up. Bryson jumps up. Fleetwood jumps up. Morikawa, Lucas Glover, Russell Henley. That's the top 10. And Ludwig, Brooks, 
Norin, Keegan, Sebez, who's having a nice week here at Memorial, DJ Connors, Justin Thomas, Cam Smith, when we take it out. And this is still factoring in some of the, especially for the live guys, some of their back end of the PGA Tour that they had. Some of this information, when you're talking about 100 rounds for players, does go back probably more than we want to actually look at. However, we do have that weighted a little bit less, and it does give us some long-term viability for a lot of these players. Some other names that kind of pop up, Finau is there. There's Denny, Hoagie, and Kitayama. Kitayama also shot an 80 or 82, something like that. I know, because he was in my main DraftKings lineup. Thanks for nothing, pal. Herman, 41st. Siwoo, 38th. And that's just what we're looking at. So I think the big thing to look at now is how that rank does versus the mixed condition model that I have built out this week. So the best players in the mixed condition model, I'll bring it up at the top of the screen so you can see the different elements that I ended up putting into it. So I went through Sawgrass, passed 24 rounds at Sawgrass over the past five years, strokes gain total. So just performance at TPC Sawgrass. I also did multiple courses for around the green. And the multiple courses that I used were ones that have shaved off areas for your surfaces. So roll out. I could have threw Hamilton in there from this year as well, because we saw a lot of that, although that, and then everything got nestled up in the thick rough a lot of the time, which you're not going to see so much at Piner. So I used Sawgrass, Heritage, Colonial, and the, the uh, Memorial Park course, where we had the Houston open this year. So I took the around the green for those four courses and threw them in as one of my weightings. That's at 11%. U.S. Open history in terms of strokes gain total for the past 24 rounds, I put in at 9%. Strokes gain total overall past 24 rounds, difficult scoring relative to par and courses over 7,400 yards. Pimehurst rolling model, I just showed you that. I put that in at 17%. Around the green on fast and lightning greens past 12 rounds at 10%. T to green past 12 rounds at difficult courses with fast and lightning greens because we're going to get that at the USGA this week. And then bogey avoidance overall past 24 rounds scoring relative to par put up to difficult and course length over 7,400. Those are the specific course conditions that I'm looking at this week. When we get to the overall winners of all of this, Scotty Scheffler, Xander Shoffley, Tommy Fleetwood, Hideki Matsuyama, Rory McIlroy, DJ somehow, Siwoo, Morikawa, Henley, Fitzpatrick, Wyndham Clark, Cam Smith, Jason Day, Denny McCarthy, Brian Harmon. That is the top 15. Brooks, Hatton, Sungjae, Finau, Homa, Bryson, Ludwig. When we're thinking about guys at the lower end of the board, Kuchar still does really well with this, and he is actually having a decent week of memorial right now on the sponsor's invite. And he's in the field, so we'll see how he ends up doing. Uh, Webb actually does pretty well, even with the poor play that he's been having Keegan Taylor Moore, probably, I mean, that's more mid tier bottom Lowry and Keegan are usually right around the same price, but seeing Kuchar still pop up this highly is very interesting to me. Harris English and Brendan Todd uh, are two, you know, they're Georgia guys themselves. They're used to this area. They're not so long off the tee, but they do kind of have the cojones, uh, especially in terms of bogey avoidance for Brendan Todd, the around the green Harris English, also very good around the green in some of the stuff that we're looking at. Uh, and, and especially at you know Heritage, uh, Houston, players, like all those places, Todd and Harris English do very well there. Cam Young is there. Ben Ann is a lot lower than I thought that he would be. Tiger comes in at 40th, although we're really digging back in the depths in order to find that. Realistically, Woodland and Woodland and Zalatoris are both hurt the most by their performance at Sawgrass and their chipping. They're chipping overall on hard courses, and they're chipping at the comp courses that I found. They're just towards the back end of the field. Overall, they're actually pretty good. Woodland especially. Um, he doesn't do well in like the, the short-term modeling at all or the strokes gain total at U.S. Opens. Despite, I mean, he does actually do well in the strokes gain total at U.S. Opens because he won one. That still actually qualifies in here. But the bogey avoidance is great for him. The tee to green is great for him. So maybe we'll throw Gary Woodland. Not what I would have expected. Coming into this, uh, Berger, you saw, had the round of the day Sunday in 2014, and he started to play a little bit better himself. Uh, then you get like Eckroat, Tom Kim, 
Tom Hoagie, Mark Hubbard. Like these are the guys that are right around the middle. Players like Noren and Cantley and Victor don't rate out so well. Now, a lot of that has to do with how poorly Victor and Cantley have played so far this season, same as Min Woo and Sam Burns, uh, as they just don't pop up very highly. I think the biggest difference between the short term Pinehurst modeling that I looked at and even the rolling report and how players do in the actual core stats that I'm looking at is Aaron Rye. Fifth in the rolling model, 63rd in the mixed condition. So when we go back uh, to the main screen and we look at that rolling model again, uh, you can take a look here. The biggest jumpers, the biggest climbers in terms of where they rate in one versus the other. Now, Scotty, Xander, Fleetwood, Hideki, Rory are all top 10 in both, as is Morikawa, as is Russell Henley. So those guys are kind of lock solid. Siwoo jumps up huge in the mixed condition from the actual modeling. Now, he wasn't bad. In the actual modeling, he was 38th. He's seventh in the mixed condition. DJ takes a big jump up. Fitz takes a big jump up. Win DC, defending US Open champion, takes a big jump up. Cam Smith, big jump. Jason Day goes from 52nd to 13th with these specific conditions, as does Harmon. Uh, Harmon and Denny make big jumps. Brooks drops a little, but he's right around where he should be. Same as Hatton. Other big jumpers. Sung Jay's a big jumper. Matt Kuchar goes from 115th to 26th. Fowler goes from 47th to 21st, 34th to 25th for John Rahm. Other big ones, Webb takes a big jump. Brendan Todd takes a big jump, as does Tiger, Woodland, Zalatoris, Chris Kirk, and Daniel Berger all take a big jump, as does Adam Shank in these rankings. Now, we think about it the other way. Who are guys that would rate out on paper to be very good at Piners based on what we've looked at as I constructed the model versus what the course conditions that I put in? Now, remember that part of the mixed condition model is this rolling report. So this this information is included in the MCM, and they're still not rating out well. You can see Aaron, Aaron Rye is the biggest loser in this list. He goes from 5th to 63rd. Bryson goes from 6th to 21st. Lucas Glover, 9th to 48th. 11th to 39th, Ben Ann. Ludwig loses about half his spots from 12th to 22nd. Still not bad, however. Norin, 14th to 51st. Keegan, 15th to 31st. Still inside the top 35. Not bad. Bez drops a little bit. Connors, 18th to 38th. Probably because he can't chip. If Corey Connors can commit to being the sort of player that Martin Keimer did in 2014, where he just says, you know what? I am going to take my putter from off the green. Although it's not, it's not like he's a good putter at all. But maybe that can help him. Now, he has done a good around the Augusta greens throughout the course of his career and putted well on them that if he can just figure that out, he could be really good. This could be the U.S. Open where the luck just kind of flops down in his favor. Uh, other guys who have massive drops, so there was Connors. Kurt Kitayama is the biggest follower of anyone, 25th to 132nd. Straka drops off hugely in the mixed conditions, as do Pendrith and Horschel and Burns. Obviously, I mentioned that Matthew Fitzpatrick moves up very big in those rankings, as does Siwoo. Anyone else drop bigly? This guy, Saladinha, ends up dropping. Victor Perez drops out. And Eric Van Royen goes from 50th to 122nd. Svensson drops pretty largely as well. Spieth gets better. He goes from 58th to 36th. So that's what we're looking at for the U.S. Open at Piners. I really hope you enjoyed the show. The discussion I had with Keith uh, really informed me and helped me build out my modeling and really try to do different types of research. Now, you just saw what was on the screen. If you're watching the video version, if you're listening to the show on the audio podcast, thank you and leave that rating and review to get yourself in the draw and to help out the show at the same time. I do think that I'm going to target the higher fairway props after looking through these stats on underdog fantasy for round one and maybe we can catch them with their pants down as soon as the props end up coming out and we pick the right guys to go along with it because you have that you can play up to eight legs on any underdog entry right now and really try to capitalize bigly in those situations so code mayo at underdog fantasy right now gets you both in the draw for all the giveaways supports this show and you get a deposit bonus of up to 250 bucks i would highly recommend that share the show around Help us out here and smash the like on the way out. More information will be coming out along with my write-up in the free newsletter, Substack Mayo Media, or just hit the description. If you hit that description, there is a ton down there, which you can find. Sometimes I put in secret giveaways down there that 
people find. There's like eight people who look at the description. It's like the same people who win all the time. Don't even announce them publicly. You need to be hitting the description in order to find out some of this material, all right? I'm Pat Mayo. Good luck at the U.S. Open. I'll see you next time. Experience! Experience!